is a more care. All right, guys, welcome again to this channel. And we're just going to try and take a look on how to do the, this question here. But see, this cafeteria in capital financing policy of this state company that would have changed from 2014 to 2015. Now we are given the question here. We are told that the current assets of the current liability of the state at the end of 2014 are as follows. So we have our current assets and current liabilities. And then they are to the end of March 2014. This debt company had domestic and foreign sales of $40 million, all on credit, while cost of sales of $36 million. Trade payables related to both domestic and foreign suppliers. And now we are given information for the year ended 2015. For the year to the end of March 2015, this has forecasted credit sales will remain at $40 million, while cost of sales will fall to 60% of sales. So cost of sales will be equal to 60% and 40 million, that is 24 million. Then the company expects current assets to consist of inventory and trade receivables, and while current liabilities to consist of trade payables and the company's overdraft. Now we're given this state also plans to achieve the following target within capital ratio for 2015 inventory days, trade receivable days, trade payable days, as well as the current ratio. Now, from the requirement of the question, we need to determine the capital cycle for 2015. We did this already from the previous question. To calculate the target quick ratio and target ratio of self metric mm -hmm. capital, we did it from the previous question already. Our main, our main concern now is part C, discuss how the working capital financing policy. So be careful on what I need to know here. We just need to discuss on how the working capital financing policy will have changed from 2015 to 20, from 2014 to 2015. This is our main goal, and I'm repeating again. When discussing the working capital financing policy, you have to, to determine the, the, the ratio of, of current liabilities to current assets, so, so as to know the percentage of current assets that is being financed by current liabilities. By checking that movement, it is when you know whether the working capital financing policy is aggressive, moderate, or actually conservative. All right, and if you remember, if you speak of the aggressive working capital financing policy, you mean that you are you, you are exposing yourself to high risk, but also to obtain the higher return by the higher risk and obtain the high return. Why? Okay, now let's just go and see how to approach this. So, if for part C, we, we already have information for 2014 up here, but we do not have information for 2015. We need the event for 2015. Trend receivable 2015, trend payables as well as overdraft, but we do not have it. So that's what we will need. So uh, I'll just go directly uh, to that part. The part that actually explains part C, right? Yeah, we, we, need, we really need to know how part C uh, would have would, would have had uh, to go to be gone through. So let's go uh, to this part, to part C, and see what we're supposed to do. So I'll just say here part C, and after reaching part C, now you can obtain it. Or you can just look even from here. For example, here we have inventory days, right? Inventory days equal to 60 days. If you have inventory days and you have actually the credit sales here of 40 million, and you have the cost of sales that is 50% of sales, you really can obtain the inventory figure. And also, if you have the trade receivable days here is 75, if you use it well, actually, you can obtain the trade receivable figure. All right, so as I, as I showed you, if you just come to this part, part C, how do I obtain the current liabilities at the end of 2015? The question itself stated that the current liabilities are formed by trade payables as well as overdraft. How do I obtain the trade payable now? This is the formula from the ratio. The previous video, trade payable period over 365 days and the cost of sale. So we are, we are given trade payable period is 55 days over 365 times cost of sale that is 24 million. How did you obtain that 24 million? I think we can just go back to the question and see. That is trade payable days is 55 days, right? This one 2015. And cost of sales, we are told that cost of sale will fall to 60% of sales. So 60% times 40 million, and we will obtain 24 million. So what you do here, you just go and plug the figures, and you will have 3 
million now how do I obtain the, the bank overdraft? Actually, no further information on bank overdraft. So let's just proceed first. All right. So first of all, actually, if you just go back to the question, I would also need current assets. That is inventory as well as trade receivables. And the question itself stated here that current assets consist of inventory and the trade receivables. We have inventory days here and we have trade receivable days. So I hope that we can use these ones to obtain uh, the inventory because inventory day 60, trade receivable day 75, we have credit sales of 40 million and we have cost of sales of 24 million. So let's just go uh, and determine these figures of inventory as well as trade receivable. How are we going to obtain that? We can just go and use the formula, right? So I uh, will just need to do the, we just do, as I said, cost of sales because to 60% of the credit sales that is 24 million. Now I can obtain inventory. How do I obtain inventory? Inventory equals to inventory holding period over 365 days and cost of sale. Inventory holding period of 60 days over 365 and cost of sale that is 24 million. I, I arrive with 3,945,206. And then I would need the trade receivable, which I obtain as follows. Trade receivable collection period over 365 days and credit sale. Receivables collection period was 75 days over 365 times 40 million, ending up with 8,219,178. And now I can have total current assets because I already have inventory as well as trade receivables. So I would sum them to obtain 12,164,384. All right, those are the current assets. So no worries up to here. I already have the current assets. And if you go back to the question, you will find that. You are provided with a current ratio. Current ratio means current assets or current liabilities. Now I have the current ratio, I have the current assets, so I can obtain the current liabilities. So I can go for that now. I need total current liabilities so that I, if I did not get trade payables, I would remain in the bank overdraft. So how do I obtain the bank overdraft? Actually, I'm just going to get that. We say that the bank overdraft will be total current liabilities minus trade payable with this figure and you obtain this one. Now, how did you obtain this total current liability? How did you obtain this one? You can just go previously, I'll compute it here. So let's just go back there. Here, uh, we just need to know the current liabilities because the current ratio equals to current assets over current liabilities. So the current liabilities would be equal to current assets over current ratio. Current assets, we have them here. So we do of our current ratio, that is 1.4, and we end up with 8,688,846. This will be the current liabilities in total. So since we have the total current liabilities, we can just need it. Uh, you can just, this one, current liabilities total this one. We can deduct trade payable figure here to obtain the bank overdraft. You know, the bank, bank overdraft always swings. It just changes depending on the receivables and payables. That's why you determine it as a balancing figure. Bank overdraft, given the bank, it just can just be said it can increase, it can decrease as long as it does not exceed the bank limit. So I have the overdraft. Now, after here, matters have become much simpler. We have to just compare it. So, comparing current assets and current liabilities for 2014 and 2015, I would have something like this as you see it here. I have March 2014 and March 2014. Now I just copied the inventory figures here. For 2014, I had these figures here. Then for 2015, I had these figures here, as you see here for 2015. Bank of overdraft is 500 million, 072,408. We had the figures in thousand, so we ignore these three figures here. So as you see here, 5072, we have 5072 here. For trade payables, that is 616, that is 616. If you sum them, you obtain total current liability. But also you have the inventory and trade receivables, which if you sum them, you have this figure. Now I'm repeating again. This is the point where you have to be careful. Let alone those ratios there. Here we are just going to a time on the working capital financing policy, whether it is aggressive, whether it is conservative, or whether it is actually uh, moderate. Be very careful here. All right. For, to obtain that, you need to take the ratio of the current liabilities to the current assets. Usually you should do that, right? So 
you just take the current ratio, you review, you, you just take the reviews of the current ratio. You know, the current ratio is current assets over current liability. It shows you the percentage of current liabilities that can be paid from current assets. But here we are speaking of the financing policy. So current liabilities of current assets it showed that the percentage of current assets financed by current liabilities. So you have to know the meaning of current ratio and the reviews, the meaning of the reviews of the current ratio. Here, you just determine the review of the current ratio. So that's why you say, at the end of March 2014, 2014, 50 current liabilities were 56% of current assets. That means we are trying to determine the percentage of current assets being financed by current liabilities. You can see here. It means current as current liabilities of current assets. If you take the 6819 over 12 to 75, you would obtain 100 percent, you would obtain 56 percent. <coughs> so what does this mean? It means that 56 percent of current assets are financed from current liabilities, and the rest are actually are financed from other long-term funds, maybe long-term liabilities and equity. So that's what you say, meaning that remaining 44 percent, you know, 44, you get 100. So the remaining 44% of current assets were financed from long term sources. And then you compare the same for March 2015. At the end of March 2015, you take current the reviews of current ratio. So current liabilities over current assets. Current liabilities here are 476 or 12164. Oh, sorry, I just counted badly. This one, the total of current liabilities is this one, 86, 88 over 12. 1,164, you, you obtain 71%. So this means that 71% of current assets are financed from short from current liabilities, while the remaining percent, that is 29%, are financed from long-term sources. Now, what can you deduce from this point here? Just take a look and see what we can deduce from this point. Our main point is, if current, if current assets are increasingly financed from current liabilities, that means we are shifting actually uh, to the aggressive or to the capital financing policy because uh, financing, you know, current liabilities are riskier than the current, I mean, short term funds are much riskier than long term funds. All right? I'm repeating again. Short term funds are much riskier than long term funds. So, here, only 56% of current liability of short-term funds are used, but here, 2015, 1% of short-term funds were used to finance current assets. So that means the risk has increased. The higher risk actually will mean that uh, it's an aggressive policy because the higher risk, the high risk is accompanied with the high returns, right? So that's what we're just going to do. So uh, the conclusion says that. The rise on the reliance on short-term funds implies an aggressive change in the working capital financing policy. That one was a very, very important point. I hope uh, you got it well, and uh, that's all uh, for today that I wanted to say, but maybe I could just check. Let, let us just complete something that is out of this one, but let us just do it. Let us just go back to the question and finish it, but this is just about some explanations. But actually, but somehow they are somehow out of they are somehow out of this out of this working capital. But actually, it's is they decided to include them together in the question. So start, start part B. Look at part B. Discuss three internal methods which could be used by CSZ to manage foreign currency transaction risk. Ways to manage foreign currency transaction risk. So these are just some examples of managing foreign currency transaction risk. Uh, because as you see that they had they had both domestic and the foreign suppliers. So there is a way to manage. How do you internally manage transaction risk? There are some methods. You can just I, I, I think I don't think if I've gone through them, but there are some methods. That you can invoice foreign customers in entities domestic currency. Let's say you're in USK, you are using US dollars, but mm -hmm. you buy some you need to sell something maybe to from to, to a UK customer. Instead of selling to them on pounds, you sell to them on your domestic currency, that is the US dollar. In that way, you won't need to worry about the transaction risk. You won't need to worry about the movement in exchange rates because that's what is equal to transaction risk, right? So that's one example. Although this one may be difficult because you know, if there is another competitor, 
that actually invoicing the customers in the in the in actually in the foreign currency, it will be very difficult for you, especially when their currencies are weaker than yours. Another point uh, is matching. You know, when you speak of something like matching, you mean that you denominate receipts and payments in the same foreign currency. It helps. You say maybe uh you maybe uh you supply you owe a supplier two million dollars, but also the customer owes you two point five million dollars. If you match them to maybe after one month, if both are paid after one month, you do not need actually to when making when doing a hedging, you do not need to hedge everything separately. You can just net them and make a hedge. But you know, for this for this transaction risk, you study them well when you reach the final level on on actually advanced financial management, right? So you're just trying to pass it in. And then you have something called leading and lagging. Leading and lagging, what do we mean by leading and lagging? Leading is maybe some you need to pay someone and you see that it's current, you have invested them in their current, they have invested in their current, in the foreign current that is much stronger. So you see that as time goes further, that current will strengthen. If it will strengthen, that means you will need to use much more of your local current. So you pay them early. But also, let's say you just need to pay someone, but that someone, the, his currency are maybe is weakening. So you can lag, you can delay the payment so that uh, if its currency depreciates with the reference to you, you can just use much smaller amount of your currency to settle the to settle the deals. Right? So that's the leading, leading and lagging, something like that. So I hope you just enjoyed this. Uh, we are done with this question, so in case there is anything you need to ask, 